Greetings and welcome to Blood Cancer Care and COVID-19, your questions answered, a live web education program. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. It is now my pleasure to introduce your moderator, Lauren Hall. Thank you, Ms. Hall. You may begin. Thank you and welcome. I want to take this time to thank everyone for participating in today's program. We have nearly 2,500 people registered. Many of you have unanswered questions and concerns about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the blood cancer community, including risk factors, treatment implications, avail available vaccines, and where to find the best information. At LLS and in your treatment centers, there are many healthcare professionals that are working diligently to make sure that your needs are addressed. You've already been through adjusting to a new normal after hearing that you or your loved one was diagnosed with cancer, and now you are having to adjust once again. As the uncertainty continues, LLS wants to help in providing you with support. All of our support services and information regarding COVID-19 are available on our website at lls.org backslash coronavirus. And if you wanna to speak to us directly, please call our information specialist at 1-800-955-4572. Let us be here for, for you. And I'm now pleased to introduce today's, uh, the speakers for today's program. We're welcoming Dr. Katrina Jamison, the Deputy Director of the UCSD Moores Cancer Center and the Director of the Sanford Stem Cell Clinical Center. And Derek Rossi, co-founder of Moderna and the current CEO of Convello Therapeutics. On behalf of the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, thank you, Dr. Jamison and Dr. Rossi for volunteering your time and expertise. And I'm now privileged to turn the program over to you, Dr. Rossi. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, evening, my time. On, I'm on the East Coast. So um, I'm Derek Rossi. I um, uh, uh, was uh, the co-founder of Moderna in, in 2010, uh, kind of a household name now. Uh, at the time, I was a professor at the Harvard Medical School, and I was a professor all the way through up until about two years ago when I retired from academia and I'm doing um, uh, other biotech ventures right now, including uh, running a company in Cleveland called uh, Convello Therapeutics focused on uh, remyelination therapies. I guess I should just start with a, uh, uh, a disclosure. Obviously, since I founded Moderna, I'm a stockholder in Moderna, and I'm not really here to, to, to do anything to you know, uh, pitch the company. Uh, which I, by the way, haven't been involved with uh, since 2014, but rather to talk to you about uh, vaccination uh, in general and the importance of this. And I'm also happy to uh, uh, talk about mRNA as a therapy or this modified mRNA technology is a, is a technology that was developed in my lab, so I know it well. But I thought I would first start because I do a lot of, um, ever since the uh, COVID pandemic uh, emerged uh, in early 2020, I've been talking to the public quite a bit through radio and television and, and webinars uh, and speaking to a lot of science reporters. And what, what's become evident to me, uh, and it's perhaps not surprising, is that actually a, a vast majority of the public uh, actually doesn't really know what vaccination is or does. And quite frankly, why should they? I mean, we get our first vaccinations when we're infants uh, and you know, barely sentient and unable to ask questions about why are you giving me the, these vaccines. Later, we get them as, as young people and we're really only concerned about getting needles then. And you know, by the time you're a young adult, you, you've gotten so many vaccines that you don't really ask a question about why am I getting this? You just think, well, it doesn't really do me any harm and apparently it does me some good, so I'll take the vaccine. And that's really the, the, the way most people think about vaccines. But, and that had become apparent to me when I kept getting these questions from science reporters, science reporters that didn't even know what vaccination was about. So I thought I would tell you a little bit about that uh, uh, today. Okay, good. So uh, we all know that uh, COVID-19 is now a global pandemic. It, it started off as a respiratory disease that uh, broke out in Wuhan in late 2019. Uh, first reported case was in the U.S. in January of 2020. Uh, the WHO didn't uh, declare it a, a, a pandemic until uh, March 11th, 2020. 
Uh, and as of a couple of days ago, when I made this slide, uh, there are currently over 2.8 million people have died from COVID-19. Uh, and in the U.S., uh, over 30 million people have been infected and over you know, 550,000 people have died. So that's the numbers and that's pretty uh, striking uh, and scary. So um, let's talk a little bit about what, why one would want to vaccinate oneself. And I think to do this, you have to start off by thinking about what it is that our immune systems normally do. Um, ever since our immune systems encountered pathogens, uh, such as viruses, uh, our bodies have been trying to defend ourselves against these pathogens and, and coming up with cellular pathways and cell types to prevent this. Uh, uh, while at the same time, the pathogens have been coming up with new and clever ways to get into us and replicate because they, they have to for their life cycle. So uh, what our immune systems normally do is constantly surveil uh, ourselves, what's come into our body, uh, looking for what is self versus non-self. That's essentially, you know, there are many different types of immune cells. There's uh, uh, innate immune cells, adaptive immune cells, but essentially the immune system is all about recognizing self from non-self. So um, when we go to vaccines, the whole goal, the, the, the whole purpose for getting vaccinated is to harness this intrinsic uh, ability of our immune systems to recognize self from non-self. So really, at its most basic, the vaccination introduces some part of the pathogen, which is, of course, foreign because it's coming from a pathogen, so that our body will recognize it and respond to it. And as I said, this is the normal function of our immune uh, system. So it's a, it's a good thing for us to ask the immune system to do, just harnessing its day-to-day -day activity, as it were. So in the case of uh, SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes um, uh, COVID-19 uh, and is um, running rampant around the planet, uh, the, uh, this is sort of a schematic here. I, I don't know if you can see my, my uh, pointer, but I, I think you can appreciate that the virus on the right side of the slide here as a schematic of what it looks like. And I think by this point now, everybody's heard of the spike protein. It's these sort of blue bugles, if you will, on the outside surface, the capsid of the virus. <clears throat> uh, and it's, it's actually the spike protein is what engages with human cells to initiate the infectious cycle. So um, if, if the human cell is down here, and here I'm waving my, <laughs> my um, uh, wand here, I don't know if you can see it at all, but um, uh, the uh, ACE2 receptor, which is expressed on essentially all of our cells, is what uh, interacts, what the uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, spike protein interacts with. That is the first contact that it makes with human cells. It latches onto that, and that initiates the infectious cycle. So pretty much for almost all of the vaccines that are being made, they're targeting this so-called spike protein. And you can imagine why. If you, if you can block the initial step in the infectious cycle, block the ability of the spike protein to interact with the ACE2 receptor, you might have a good chance of warding off infection. So essentially all of, not, not all, but most of the vaccines, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a while, uh, target this spike protein as the thing uh, that, that's introduced to our immune systems to initiate an immune response. It makes sense. Uh, and by the way, it's years and years of virologists doing fantastic work that gave us the knowledge that coronaviruses in general, it's a family of viruses, use spike proteins as a way of initiating their infectious cycle, latching onto human cells. Mm -hmm. Uh, and by the way, you've heard that, you know, the term coronavirus comes from actually what these viruses look like uh, due to these spike proteins. It sort of gives it a corona-like appearance, and this is where the name coronavirus comes from, and it's essentially the spike protein, which sticks out. You know, the hand is a good uh, demonstration of this, my fingers. Um, <clears throat> so um, 
I just said this, uh, that basically the, you know, this, the, you know, what you're getting in most of the vaccines is not the whole coronavirus, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. You're not getting its genetic material. You're not getting its capsid proteins, its envelope proteins. You're pretty much getting something that either expresses or encodes this blue bugle, if you will, this spike protein. Uh, and that is what your immune system is being asked to mount a response to. <clears throat> so what does your immune system do when it sees this spike protein? Uh, because that's basically the purpose of vaccination. Well, it, it, it does a number of things. Our, our immune systems are, are sophisticated. As I said, you know, ever since uh, humans and pathogens first met one another, pathogens have been trying to get in and our bodies have been evolving pathways and cell types to try to keep that from happening. So you've heard, for example, that antibodies are produced. So antibodies are produced by a certain type of immune cell called B cells, uh, and they are very specific to antigens. So I've just introduced a new term. So an antigen is something that the immune system responds to. So in this case, the antigen is this little bit of the coronavirus that's put into people, uh, the spike protein in this case. So the spike protein is the antigen in this case. Uh, and our antibodies develop so that they're very specific and it's, it's a very elegant system for how they develop to be very tight binders of antigens, and in this case, the spike protein. So antibodies will be produced that have very, very high affinity for binding to uh, the antigen, the spike protein in this case. But there are other aspects of the immune system which are activated. For example, you've heard of you might have heard of a T cell response in, in patients that are vaccinated. And indeed, a host of T cells are activated. It's a different type of immune system, which can, for example, in the case of cytotoxic T cells, recognize cells that are infected with the pathogen uh, and kill those cells, because it's actually a good thing to kill cells uh, that have been infected prior to uh, the pathogen taking over, making millions of copies of itself, releasing that and having many more cells uh, infected. So this is the job of, of the T cell compartment of our immune cells. So just advance here. So when, when a person gets vaccinated, they generate an antibody response. And you probably heard the term neutralizing antibodies. Neutralizing antibodies means that when you expose the antibody to the viral particle, it actually does what you anticipated it would do, which is bind strong to the spike protein and inhibit its ability to latch on to the ACE2 receptor and thereby neutralize the ability of the virus to infect the cells. So neutralizing antibodies are, are generated. The T cell compartment is um, readied. Uh, and uh, that's all that happens in the vaccinated person, actually. And so the idea is that this immune system has been put at the ready. The antibodies are made, the T cells are at the ready. And now when the person who's been vaccinated goes out into the grocery store or the, you know, the bank or uh, wherever they happen to be and they encounter, encounter the virus in real time, in, you know, you go out and get infected, you've got a, a friend or a colleague or a, a schoolmate or whoever it is that's infected, they pass that infection on to you. But now instead of having a, 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 an immune system that's never seen the pathogen before, it's already ready with neutralizing antibodies uh, and a T cell response to really blunt the infection very, very early uh, and um, mitigate getting COVID-19 and getting really sick and getting put in the hospital and potentially dying. So that's the whole objective of getting vaccinated. And indeed, as we've seen borne out by the clinical trials uh, and the real life studies of these uh, vaccines, they're actually very effective at doing that. So somebody is advancing my slides. <laughs> Not sure who, but I'll take control again if I may. Um, so um, there are many different, so I, I, 
talk about vaccination in, in there's kind of two stages of vaccination. There's the how do you deliver this antigen to the to the person to initiate the immune response? And then there's the whole immune response side, which is essentially the same every no matter what you get vaccinated for, the objective is always the same to ready the immune system should you uh, encounter the pathogen uh, after post vaccination. So you've heard a lot about different technologies that have been used now to uh, give the front end of that, which is how do you deliver the antigen? How do you present the antigen to the to the person that's being vaccinated? Uh, and there are actually many different ways of doing it. They're just sort of outlined in these boxes here. So for example, you know, traditionally vaccines were made and for, for many years, they were actually made by actually growing up large amounts of the actual pathogen that one wanted to vaccinate against uh, and inactivating that pathogen so that it wouldn't be infectious anymore, but essentially giving the whole virus minus its basically its replication potential to a person to have them mount an immune response against this sort of inert yet whole virus uh, and initiate their immune response in that way. Uh, attenuated virus, that's a live virus, but it's its function has been disabled to some degree. So it still functions, it still infects, but it basically, you know, been sort of seriously, it's, you know, had three of its tires blown out. So it's not a very fast uh, moving vehicle anymore. So you can mount an immune response to that. So vaccines that are made, for example, by uh, Sinopharm or Sinovac in China use uh, whole inactivated uh, virus technology. It's an old, true uh, technology. You could also just, for example, introduce the protein itself. Do you remember I said we just really need to, you know, immunize or or, or uh, be have our immune systems be readied to respond to the spike protein? So, for example, the vaccine being developed by Novavax does just a recombinant protein, just an artificial protein made, and that's given to people to stimulate their immune system to respond to this. You've heard a lot, and we'll talk more about it today, of newer technologies uh, for example, the mRNA, modified mRNA technologies developed by Moderna or BioNTech Pfizer. And um, I'll tell you more about that, although I haven't planned, I don't have it in the slideshow, but I'll, I'll happily tell you what those do. Uh, and then there, you've, you've also heard of uh, another technology, which is this adenovirus-based uh, technology. And you might be thinking to yourself when you hear that for the first time, adenovirus, they give me a virus to make me, which is, that, is that because it stimulates my immune system? What's going on there? No, actually what those are doing, so adenovirus are actually very common viruses for many different species, uh, including humans and apes. Uh, and so what you can do with uh, these viruses uh, in the laboratories, you can sort of gut out their genetic material, uh, which would um, express, you know, adenovirus proteins in you and replace it with, for example, the coronavirus spike protein. So that when you get infected by these recombinant, they're called recombinant uh, viruses, um, what you're being what, the, what those viruses are now delivering is uh, information to express the, the spike protein. Uh, and those are actually really very new technologies as well. And those are being uh, developed by uh, you know, AstraZeneca, which you've heard, and J&J uh, uh, &J and, and others. So um, we'll talk more about RNA, although I don't have it in the, the slide deck here, but I'm sure you want to hear more about that, considering that the two fastest to market vaccines were from Moderna and Pfizer BioNTech. Uh, and many of you are probably being offered these because they're, you know, uh, being given by the t uh, tens or hundreds of millions of doses in the US. So I'm sure you know somebody who's uh, received one of these vaccines. So a, a question that I get a lot is, um, well, how did this happen so quickly? You know, how is it that, you know, because I remember watching on the TV last year in, in 2020, and it really, <laughs> I, I could see it coming. You would see these sort of talking heads on, on these news shows, um, and they'd be asked the question, well, you know, when are we going to have a vaccine for, for this um, pandemic? And they would say, well, you know, three, two, three, four years, you know, that's the usual uh, time it takes to develop a, a vaccine. Uh, and so when the vaccines, well, 
I should say that these newer technologies, the adenovirus and the mRNA, are actually by themselves lend themselves to speed. So unlike traditional vaccines where you have to grow up huge amounts of uh, virus and inactivate them to give them to people, these are very easily uh, made quickly. That's number one. But number two, and I think this is the, the oh, it, so the first bullet that, that I want to, I should spend a little bit more time on there is that uh, low mRNA um, vaccines, this is the first time mRNA therapeutics have actually come to market. It's not for lack of clinical experience. Um, so for example, I founded Moderna in 2010, uh, and as of prior to the start of this pandemic, they had already run many, many, many clinical trials for different drugs in their pipeline, which all involve mRNA, many of which were targeting uh, different pathogens, so uh, uh, vaccines. Uh, so there was that clinical experience. And in fact, that was part of the bet that the U.S. government made because, of course, all those clinical trials had been seen by the U.S. FDA and their, the authorities, and they had seen the clinical experience that this was a technology that could be put into people safely and, indeed, do what the objective was, which was to elicit immune response to a particular pathogen or part of a pathogen that was being expressed. So that clinical experience was actually had already, and that's something that isn't really talked about in the media, but that's actually true. I think the other really important thing that, that people don't realize is that the typically what happens with um, uh, clinical trials is that you run a, a phase one trial, that's the first one you run, and that's usually a dose finding trial and a, a safety trial. And usually companies don't start, and here I'm, I'm actually, a, it's a mirror image of me, so I gotta move my hand this way, I guess. Um, the um, Usually what you don't do is you don't run a phase two before you've finished your phase one, and you don't run a phase three before you finish your phase two, and the reason for that is because, well, if you if it doesn't work in phase one and you're already in phase two or phase three, companies would be spending a lot of money on those clinical trials and that money would be sort of all at risk. It would be down the drain. So typically what you do is you do your phase one, you do your you wait for the data, you, you look at all the data, you do, do your phase two, you wait till that ends, look at all your data, you do your phase three. That was not done in this case because of the um, severity of the pandemic, how um, pathogenic, how deadly the virus was when it first emerged. It had a, you know, a, um, a, a lethality rate of about 2% of people. Uh, this is before we started to develop other therapies that, that um, uh, helped mitigate that uh, and ventilators and know how to, how to deal with uh, people that got sick. So the decision was be made to do the start the phase two shortly after the beginning of phase one and start the phase three shortly after the beginning of, of uh, phase two. Now, um, that could be done, as I said, because already there was extensive clinical experience with other vaccines that had already sort of figured out dose finding, you know, what, what, a, what an appropriate dose would be to, and even though still in the phase one, there was still, it was still a dose finding study. Uh, and there was this safety data uh, associated with it as well. And quite frankly, governments around the world, including the U.S. government, stepped in and put their money on the line to really accelerate the progress of these, um, of these uh, 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 vaccines. So that was really critical, and, and, and kudos to the people in charge for having the, the foresight to, to be able to do that, because it really, you know, we went from, as I said at the beginning, you know, um, respiratory disease breaks out in Wuhan in late 2019, first cases to, uh, January 2020 in the U.S., uh, and we had emergency approved vaccines by December of 2020, kind of 10 months after the fact, this whole effort was started. And that really is unprecedented. Uh, unprecedented. But it wasn't because any steps were skipped. In fact, all of the necessary phase one, phase two, phase three were done. They were just done uh, in a, uh, uh, an overlapping manner, not a sequential manner. The other thing that, I, that I've heard a lot and I get asked a lot about 
which is actually turns out to be not true is well everybody so but you see a lot of these you know uh, people writing on the Facebook or whatever it is that you know everything was done in secret and and you know I should be really worried about this because it was done in secret. Actually, the 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 uh, committees, uh, the panels of experts, which are independent experts that analyze the clinical uh, the clinical trial data and assess its safety and efficacy, and uh, ultimately the the bodies responsible for governing uh, emergency use authorization, those, and this is unprecedented as well, those meetings were actually all live streamed. So, and again, it was partly, you know, the idea was, hey, this happened really quick. We want to make sure that people have confidence in this pro uh, process. So they live stream uh, these meetings and I actually, you know, watch them for a day long on the, on the, uh, on the web. Anybody could watch them. I'm not actually sure if they're recorded or not. I'm sh I'll, I'll bet they are. So you can go out and watch them yourselves, but they are just as they are every time for every drug that passes through a, a clinical trial, you know, a large team of experts that are asking really important questions about safety and efficacy. And only when they get comfortable with the data that says this is safe and efficacious, do they, uh, give the thumbs up to the regulatory agencies to say we think this is this is this should this should go into patients. So you can you can like I said I'm not sure if it's uh, um, uh, recorded but I'll bet you it is. Another part of the reason that um, this happened so quickly was that there was actually an investment in manufacturing done by the companies and and even though there are new technologies mRNA had never been a an approved drug before there had been large investment in manufacturing that allowed for example once the sequence of the virus was um, put on the web by the Shanghai consortia in January the next day the NIH and uh, Moderna had designed an mRNA for the spike protein. Uh, and 42 days later, uh, Moderna had a clinical grade um, uh, vaccine ready to go into people that they ship to the National Institutes of Health. So 42 days is to, to make a new medicine, to make a new vaccine. Again, that is really amazing. And it it's it it uh, it normally would not take that long. If you had to grow up vaccine or um, sorry virus and inactivate it or in attenuate it, it would take much longer because it does take much longer. So that was important. The manufacturing infrastructure was there to do this, not at scale, not at you know billions of doses. And this is where the bottleneck arises. But but certainly for getting clinical trials uh, run. And then I think I've already mentioned this, there was a massive mobilization of, of resource and brain power. I mean, really everybody, every scientist uh, on the planet was thinking about this and, and trying to move this, you know, move the ball forward and, and how can we mitigate this? And that and then that's just not just in the vaccine world, but um, also in the, the therapeutic domain. And, and we can probably talk about some of the therapies that emerged as well. So I'll, um, I, this is a, just a, a slide. This is science data. And I realize that most watching are probably not scientists, but it's relatively easy to understand. It's actually data, you know, um, that was published um, on the clinical trial that was run for the Moderna uh, vaccine, which is called mRNA 1273. Uh, and I already told you this that you know, SARS was published, the genome was published, and so this very specific uh, spike protein mRNA was designed. Uh, phase three placebo-controlled trial was run. 15,000 people got the vaccine, 15,000 got the placebo uh, that was blinded, so one didn't know what, if you got the placebo or the vaccine you were expected to go on with your normal life. And then they measured uh, the incidence of, of uh, people getting COVID. And so the cumulative event rate is on the y-axis here and time uh, is on the x-axis. Uh, and there's a gray bar or a gray line here, which is placebo arm and the blue uh, line, which is those that were vaccinated. So you can see that dose one was here on, on day zero, uh, dose two on day 28. And then they started um, evaluating the data from this uh, uh, dashed line here. And what you could see is that those that got the mRNA were protected from getting the uh, uh, 
from getting COVID and getting severe disease. Uh, that's on the y-axis, whereas those that were unvaccinated continued, and don't forget it was a raging pandemic at this point, continued at a very, very fast rate to get COVID-19. And so this is where, you know, the efficacy numbers are deemed from. When you do large trials like that, 30,000 participants, you have the statistical power, you've powered it to be able to uh, say that um, this data basically represents a 94.1% uh, efficacy. Those that were vaccinated had that much protection against getting COVID. Uh, there were 30 severe cases uh, in this clinical trial of 196 cases. Um, all 30 of those people that got severe COVID were in the placebo arm, none in the um, vaccine arm. Uh, and unfortunately, there was one death of somebody, and that was also in the uh, placebo arm. So um, there was 100% or 94% effective at getting COVID-19. Uh, but 100% effective against severe uh, disease. And this type of data has been borne out now in the real world with tens of millions of people uh, now being vaccinated and being protected. <clears throat> so uh, people um, always ask me about variants uh, and you know how is the vaccine that they're gonna get now? Is it going to be protective against the variants that are emerging? First thing I'll say about <clears throat> uh, variants is that they are absolutely expected. Um, viruses are, you know, from an evolutionary perspective, uh, you know, wonders of, of, of nature. I, you know, they're, they're very, very impressive. The rate by which they replicate in any one person is, you know, hundreds of millions of replications. And what you need to get for variants who arise is mutations arising during these replications. Uh, and then there's a selective pressure that um, will, if most of the mutation that happens during replication is bad and it, it doesn't do the virus any good at all, but occasionally you'll get mu uh, 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 um, um, mutations that, for example, alter the spike protein. This is the spike protein. This is the genome, the proteins made by the coronavirus. And this is a variant uh, that emerged in South Africa called the B1351 variant. And you can see that actually many of the mutations, these are mutations, these little dots here, and these, uh, what, what the amino acid change is, actually occur in the spike protein, but not just the spike protein. But what will happen with uh, w when there's selective pressure is that a variant that has a selective advantage over, you know, its um, uh, uh, original strain will do better. So for example, strains that emerge that are more infectious will do better because they'll infect more people uh, and they'll propagate themselves at a more effective rate. So I highlight this particular variant, 351, which uh, emerged in South Africa in October of 2020. Uh, and scientists, of course, as soon as a new variant emerges, they wanna ask, well, is, are the vaccines that we've already got out in the population, will they protect us against this? And you can do that experiment pretty simply by taking um, antibodies um, from a person that's been uh, vaccinated from the first, um, from uh, the, back, the Gen 1 vaccine, let's call it that, and or Gen 1 get a COVID-19 infection, and then ask whether or not those antibodies, which you can take out and then put in a dish, ask whether or not they can neutralize the variant. Uh, virus. Um, and it was actually determined in these experiments that this, this particular uh, variant, this 351, while the antibodies that are generated by the Gen 1 vaccine are still probably considered sufficient to neutralize uh, this variant, they did so certainly less effectively. In contrast to many of the other variants, by the way, which the neutralizing antibodies for example, in the British uh, variant, which is more infectious at, and and therefore more deadly, uh, and you know becoming pervasive because it's more infectious. And the reason it's more infectious is it again spike protein binds better to human cells through the mutation. It just has a tighter bond to the ACE2 receptor. 
But yet the antibodies work very, very effectively against those variants. They work a little less effectively against this variant, although uh, probably still sufficient to protect. But that said, these new technologies, which can turn on a dime, um, you know, after getting the data that suggested that Gen 1 vaccines might not, might not be quite as good against this variant, they very quickly synthesized a variant-specific mRNA. Uh, they did so in uh, February uh, of uh, 2021. So from October 20, when it first emerged, to February 24th, it's a very for short time period. They ship material to the NIH to begin clinical studies on this variant-specific mRNA, which is called 1273-351 for this variant's name. Uh, and the first patient was dosed in March of, of 2021. And as I said, you know, the, the British strain, which you've heard a lot, which is certainly more infectious and more deadly, this B117, and even the P1 uh, Brazil strain, which is also, you know, raging through New York, um, current vaccines appear to be quite good at, at neutralizing uh, uh, those. So people ask me, well, what's the, what's the, What's going to be the strategy going forward? Are we going to have our, our variants going to emerge that you know don't work at all for these with these vaccines? And actually, it's we're we're a little bit in luck here. So how the uh, spike protein interacts with the ACE2 receptor? It's it's a physical interaction. It's a structural interaction. You know, I try to make a structure here so it it fits. You know. The spike protein fits into this ACE2 receptor, and it's a nice fit, and that's what initiates the infectious cycle. So there's a selective pressure on keeping the spike protein looking more or less what it looks like. For example, if it mutated to look like this, that wouldn't fit into the ACE2 receptor anymore, and it basically would be non-infectious. So that would not be a, a very advantageous mutation or set of mutations for um, the, the virus to, to get. So it's got to be something that still fits in, and maybe it fits in and binds a little bit tighter, for example, like you know uh, B117. Uh, but there is a selective pressure that it just can't look so completely different. Point being that if the vaccines are made, in what shape was I using here? I guess I was using the hand shape here, maybe the other way. The vaccines were made against something that looked like this. And so even though that thing might change a little bit, I can scrunch my fingers a little bit more. The vaccines still, nonetheless, Gen 1 are working pretty effectively against it. And if it changes so much, the technologies that we have, the adenovirus, the mRNA, other technologies can respond very quickly uh, and we'll be able to address it. So that's what I wanted to talk about. And I know I didn't talk about uh, mRNA too much, and I'm happy to tell you about what mRNA is, but maybe we'll save it for the Q&A section. I think I've gone over time here, and I would like to turn it over to uh, Katrina to, uh, to uh, talk to you as well. Thank you so much, uh, Derek. As usual, you've been extremely self-deprecating about this life-saving technology that you were at the forefront of developing all the way back in 2010. I remember when you were person of the year for Time Magazine, and it was very impressive then. And, you know, um, none of us knew how important that technology would be and uh, how that would change the trajectory for people, not just with blood cancer. It's a very, very important field, but all of us. So thank you. I got the Moderna vaccine. I know you got the Pfizer one, uh, but it really changed the paradigm for how quickly new therapies could be introduced, including vaccines. So I'd like to talk a little bit about what do we do beyond vaccinating patients and all of us actually to try and keep us safe from this deadly pandemic? And I really wanted to think about the book Blood Cancer or the, the book uh, Love in the Time of Cholera by Gra Gabriel Garcia Marquez. He got the Nobel Prize. It was basically to remind us that love uh, reigns supreme, love wins out despite cholera, similarly blood cancer research, and the, the kind of research that you just summarized so nicely, Derek, wins out as well. So it's a very similar bottom line, essentially. Um, so cancer doesn't stop for COVID, neither does blood cancer research, 
funded by the Leukemia Lymphoma Society and our other very strong funding partners. So I wanted to say there is a good news story, weirdly, to this COVID pandemic. You heard about the massive mobilization of resources from Derek, and these are resources to really help us understand the basic underpinnings of immune responses to this um, SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus, but also it helps us to understand how cancers evolve, how the immune system doesn't see a cancer, and how we can invigorate the immune system to see it better. So we know that the Leukemia Lymphoma Society has put a lot of time, effort, and funding into understanding the basis for um, blood cancer development, actually going all the way back to the blood-forming stem cell. So the hematopoietic stem cells that we have in our bone marrow can give rise to all the different blood types in our body. And of course, this gives rise to a functioning immune system. As Dr. Rossi mentioned, we have B and T cells that help to fight viruses like SARS-CoV-2. But all of those cells actually derive initially from a hematopoietic stem cell. And so too can a number of blood cancers. So what Derek Rossi and Irv Weissman and I published actually way back in 2008, that um, is that as stem cells age in inflammatory microenvironments and perhaps in response to sustained inflammation from viral infections, we activate this mutagenic pattern where the mutations arise in the stem cell and that leads to propagation of cells that lack the capacity to understand go what's called uh, apoptosis, so they can't die. They can't turn the tumor um, pathways off, and they live for a long time because they activate this enzyme called telomerase. And then ultimately, they learn to evade both innate immune responses that are driven by cells called natural killer cells and our cells called neutrophils, as well as adaptive immune responses driven by cells called T cells uh, that Derek alluded to. Then finally, they learn to clone themselves. And that process called self-renewal is a very malignant process. So why am I talking about all this? It's supposed to be about COVID. Well, it turns out um, that if we can make people's immune systems healthier, if we can treat blood cancers more effectively and get more people into sustainable remissions, they're less likely to have severe outcomes from COVID, less likely to get the infection in the first place, um, provided they've had a good vaccine strategy. So really what we're interested in is looking at how uh, blood cancers evolve from a normal stem cell state to a pre-leukemia stem cell state. If we talk about uh, myeloid disorders like myelodysplastic syndrome and myeloproliferative neoplasms and how they evolve ultimately to what are called leukemia stem cells that can clone themselves. So this is um, the way the field has really taken off recently. You see how the, all of the understanding of vaccination technology has really allowed us to move ahead very, very quickly uh, in terms of understanding the immune system. It's also provided a better infrastructure for understanding how cancers evolve. How is a cancer initiated? How is it born from a stem cell? There's been seminal work done in this area by Uli Steidel and Amit Verma and Britta Will and others in myelodysplastic syndrome to show that there are very specific mutations that occur at the level of the hematopoietic stem cell and they give rise to disordered uh, maturation. So these cells don't function quite properly. And that's something that we can start to detect very early on. Um, so we can detect the pre-leukemia stem cells before they even become leukemia stem cells. And a lot of the technology that was developed to make the vaccine and to understand how these vaccine or these um, strains of COVID-19 evolve actually can be brought to bear to understand how blood cancers evolve. Can we actually start to detect and treat blood cancers in their infancy and actually prevent progression to a full-blown cancer, and by making people's immune systems healthier, actually reduce their risk of having severe infections with SARS-CoV-2, in addition to having very effective vaccines for everyone. So we know that um, myelodysplastic syndrome is a, can be a pre-leukemic disorder that uh, progresses to leukemia. Well, so can myeloproliferation of neoplasm. These are disorders where you make too many of one type of blood cell in the bone marrow. Major advances have been made in this area. Leukemia Lymphoma Society has invested heavily in understanding why people develop these myeloproliferative neoplasms and why they progress. So recently we discovered that 
want an antiviral enzyme that protects our stem cells from viruses, um, prevents them from integrating into our DNA, is actually activated in um, pre-leukemia stem cells and actually leads to stem cell expansion. So the reason that's important is it tells us that if we have our antiviral enzymes turned on for too long, if that capacity of the antiviral enzymes isn't brought into um, proper control, they can actually lead to pre-leukemia and leukemia. So apobag 3 c is one enzyme. Another enzyme that we see activated at the same time is an enzyme called ADAR1 in the same cells that overexpress apobag. So at the stem and progenitor level, we get apobag 3 c and ADAR1 being activated. This leads to full leukemic transformation. You can see here they bind to each other and they actually co-localize in leukemia cells. So it's essentially a Bonnie and Clyde story. So the bottom line is you don't want these antiviral enzymes to be activated too robustly or for too long because they can actually take a pre-leukemia and make it a full-blown leukemia. So that all sounds rather alarming, except um, that we think that there's a way to block that. Um, we can detect the cells as they go from pre-leukemia to leukemia stem cells. We know that we can shut down this process using JAK2 inhibitors, fedratinib is one, ruxolitinib is another one. Uh, that seems to block the ability of this antiviral enzyme called ADAR1 to induce the problems that lead to leukemia stem cell generation. So we already have uh, fedratinib and, as I mentioned, ruxolitinib that seem to turn this down. And then this other drug called desatinib uh, that I'm sure some of you on this call know about. It blocks the gene that induces chronic myeloid leukemia called BCRABO, but also ADAR1. So um, what else do we do to prevent pre-leukemia stem cell progression to full-blown leukemia? What we find is when people start to transition from normal stem cell aging over into leukemia stem cells, they actually change splicing. So splicing is how we make different copies of the same gene. What we found is that we can block that splicing process. We have a splicing fluorescent reporter, and we scale up production of the splicing modulator uh, to really say, can we turn back the clock on leukemia stem cells and make them behave like normal aged stem cells? cells. In another attempt to improve um, the immune system by inducing deeper responses, we've developed other uh, leukemia st or cancer stem cell targeting agents. In other words, cancer sometimes hijacks stem cell pathways and specifically the, ca the capacity of stem cells to regenerate or clone themselves. Myeloma does this. We know that um, we can inhibit or block a stem cell pathway called the hedgehog pathway in a large array of blood cancers. This has been very effective. We did this for myeloid leukemias and it doubled survival with a drug called Glasdegib, now FDA approved as Durismo. But that strategy didn't work as well in multiple myeloma where they developed ADAR driven methods uh, the cells themselves to get around uh, the hedgehog inhibitors. So more recently, we used RNA technology to actually target these uh, myeloma stem cells in a preclinical model together with a local company called Ionis and just published the results showing that if you target this essential driver of myeloma regeneration called IRF4, you can actually block myeloma from regenerating it. So the reason I'm bringing this story up is this is RNA technology. This is what's coming from the technology that Derek Rossi and others helped to bring to the fore. Now RNA technologies or therapeutics go beyond vaccines, and we can now think about really using them to target cancer and some of the most refractory cancers. The other thing uh, we've learned is that we can also use um, technologies like the technologies that Derek Rossi developed uh, for making what are called induced pluripotent stem cells to make them grow up and become parts of the immune system, natural killer cells. Sometimes what happens with cancer is our immune system is distracted looking at other things, perhaps a, a virus, and it doesn't know to attack the cancer. Um, Dan Kaufman, working together with a company called Fate Therapeutics, 
developed an, an NK natural killer cell from an induced pluripotent stem cell and showed that these cells were extremely effective at targeting a number of tumors, lymphoma and other solid tumors. That uh, clinical trial started a year and a half ago here at UC San Diego at the Moore's Cancer Center. Uh, but it just shows you we can make new technologies by our expanded understanding of the immune system because of problems like having a pandemic where we need to understand how the immune system works. The other group that's very interested in understanding the process of uh, pre-cancer stem cell development, particularly in the blood, is actually NASA. So as you may have seen, the NASA twin study demonstrated that repeated or protracted periods in low Earth orbit on the International Space Station seemed to increase inflammatory growth factor expression and seemed to accelerate stem cell aging in Scott Kelly. So even though Scott Kelly, who spent all almost a year in space, came back two inches taller than his twin brother. Unfortunately, his blood had aged and he developed inversions, translocations, and other aspects of accelerated stem cell aging that make us think that he would be put at risk for pre-cancer or pre-leukemia. So we're developing a bioreactor that will go up onto the International Space Station in what's called the Integrated Space Stem Cell Orbital Research Lab. This is a collaboration with NASA as well as Space Tank go to see can we understand the process of pre-cancer development in an environment where there's um, a considerable amount of radiation higher than we have on Earth and more exposure to inflammatory growth factor stimulating signals that would activate this pre-leukemia stem cell path. So we've had a lot more um, that we're able to do now in blood cancer research, partly as a result of just having more funding for research, more interest in really trying to normalize the immune system. So what about COVID-19 in patients with cancer? Uh, there have been a, a few papers published on the case fatality rate of patients with cancer. This, this is one in the New York hospital system with Amit Verma. I'm really looking at what happens in people with blood cancers or hematologic malignancies as they're known compared to solid tumors. And you'll see that the um, rates of mortality are actually higher in patients with hematologic malignancies. So whereas with solid tumors, the mortality rate is about 25%. With hematologic malignancies or blood cancers, it's about 37%, with the highest uh, being in myelodysplastic syndrome and in um, you know diseases like uh, multiple myeloma, which is why I was showing you the data for that, and then in myeloid malignancies like the myeloproliferative neoplasms. Um, so th you know there, there does seem to be an emerging difference between the different types of blood cancers. These numbers are very small. This is a single institution study, so we really need to start looking at at larger studies, larger data sets. This is one focusing specifically on COVID-19 infection-related mortality in patients with myeloproliferative neoplasms. Uh, this was published by Claire Harrison and Alessandro Rambaldi, a very um, big cooperative group that works on myeloproliferative neoplasms, where they looked at actually a fairly high mortality rate in patients with COVID-19, and uh, particularly after withdrawal of a standard of care drug called ruxolitinib. So what they found was in the um, patients with myelofibrosis, which is an advanced form of a myeloproliferative disorder, uh, their survival was lower than the earlier stage myeloproliferative neoplasms. In patients who um, were admitted to the ICU, their survival rate was lower than those who were able to stay at home. And when you look at the kinds of reasons for mortality in this um, group, it looked like advanced age, um, male sex, the diagnosis of myelofibrosis um, were associated with an increased risk of death from COVID. But it really um, came down to this difference as well with ruxolitinib or Jacophy discontinuation. And we know that people can drop their blood pressure if they discontinue uh, ruxolitinib, also known as Jacophy. But it kind of begs the question, is this JAK2 inhibitor actually inhibiting viral replication? Is that why people did a little bit better if they didn't have the ruxolitinib uh, stopped? And that's still a question for the field that everyone's trying to answer. 
Um, we know that ruxolitinib is not the only JAK2 inhibitor. The FDA approved another JAK2 inhibitor called fedratinib. We know with severe COVID, there's a marked expansion and dysregulation of what's called the myeloid cell compartment. So you've heard of cytokine storm in the setting of severe COVID-19. Part of that is because we massively expand these cells that are called the myeloid compartment in the immune system to try and fight the virus, but it makes so many inflammatory growth factors that it really overwhelms our system. So the question is, can that be dialed down a little bit with drugs like fedratinib or like ruxolitinib? And basically those clinical trials are being done now, but we'll see how they go. The main point is prevent infection as much as possible and really get vaccinated. In terms of the COVID-19 vaccine, as uh, Derek was alluding to, this highly efficient method for making our um, vaccines now is predicated on an, a modified mRNA. And if you think about it, so DNA is like the blueprint, the architect's blueprint for your house. The RNA is like the engineer's interpretation of that. There may be a support beam that has to go up. And then the protein is what the builder would interpret in terms of what materials to use. Because of this modified mRNA technology that Derek and colleagues really initially made to make induced pluripotent stem cells more effectively and then repurposed for making vaccines, we have a completely novel and safe way of making vaccines now. And of course, that's the royal we. Uh, this is up to Pfizer and Moderna and other companies, but it looks like this is a very effective strategy. And I think this is just going to change the landscape in general for how vaccines are made. And what you see, um, as was recently published in the New England Journal, is antibody persistence through over six months after the second dose. This is of the Moderna vaccine, but the data are looking very similar for Pfizer in terms of efficacy. And it looks similar whether you're 18 to 55, 56 to 70 or greater than 71. So that's a very good news story for these vaccines. Um, SARS-CoV-2 infection after vaccination in healthcare workers was published by our group here at UC San Diego. And what you see is you really have to wait 14 days, at least 14 days after you've had your second dose, uh, because we are seeing a slight um, rate of infection in people that have been vaccinated, but they didn't wait. So we have to make sure that there's the right timing so that you've got a proper immune response to the vaccine before you start going out and seeing everyone. We should all still be wearing masks in public. So we still have to take a lot of precautions. These masks really work. I know it's not high tech, but it really works. And I've got to say, you know, when I was on call in January for um, the inpatient hematology service, I was really um, shocked by the number of people that had COVID uh, who were in hospital that looked quite a bit younger. We had 177 people in hospital with COVID. It was a severe infection. Uh, today, it's 20 in all our hospitals. That's a dramatic decline. Our um, positivity rate here is 2% in San Diego. It's gone down dramatically because of vaccination. So the main point with COVID is prevent it. I'd like to thank our funding agencies and um, really move on to the next um, discussion because we know you have a lot of questions and we'd like to be able to answer to them. Thanks very much for your time. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Jameson and Dr. Rossi for that foundation um, of learning. So we are going to move into the question and answer session. So that this is a benefit for all in attendance, we are only going to be asking questions that are general in nature. If you have a more specific question that you'd like answered after the program, please contact our information specialist at 1-800-955-4572 or reach out to your treating oncologist. Um, I'd now like to introduce you to our moderator for the Q&A session, the Chief Medical Officer at the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, Dr. Gwen Nichols. Dr. Nichols, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Lauren. And I just want to say thank you to Dr. Rossi and Dr. Jamison um, for being so kind to donate your time and giving such really uh, clear and interesting information. Uh, and I want to also thank the participants because um, we got a, just a, a really wide array of incredibly interesting and important questions. And I'll do my best to give some uh, flavor uh, and, and, and we'll have answers as best as we can. So the first, 
The first area that a lot of people asked about had to do with the risk of death um, and severe disease from COVID-19. And I think uh, Dr. Jameson uh, spoke to that uh, very eloquently, but I wondered uh, if you might talk a little bit more about um, any specifics for people who are survivors or who are further out or who are not currently taking treatment um, about their risk for COVID-19. Yeah, and I imagine this has a lot to do with people's um, concern about their individual blood cancer. And there are certainly certain types of blood cancers, as I showed there, where there seems to be a higher risk of mortality or having severe COVID-19 if you contract that. One um, of those types of um, cancer is called a myeloproliferative neoplasm, where the mortality rate seemed higher in people that contracted COVID-19. Uh, the other one, we're seeing slightly higher rates of severe COVID-19 infection are people with chronic lymphocytic leukemia, even if they're in the watch and wait period where they're not having active treatment. And part of the reason for that is the B cell part of the immune response doesn't work very well because the cancer arises in that B cell population, so the B cells don't work. People still have active T cells, though. And so I think there, there are ways to mitigate the risk of having severe COVID-19 infection. First of all, get vaccinated. Even if you didn't, even if you had the uh, infection before, as Derek mentioned so eloquently, there are four variants at least that we know of um, that really may not have seen your immune system before, where you may need a vaccination to really ensure that you have proper immunity. So, you know, the um, rate of severity of COVID-19 has a lot to do with age. It has a lot to do with uh, male sex, partly because there's a co-receptor for ACE2 called Tempris2, and that is, is a male hormone responsive receptor. Um, but not all is lost. Uh, what we found over the last more than year since we've been dealing with COVID as a pandemic uh, in the U.S. and around the world is early detection of infection, early in, um, intervention, preferably, um, you know, vaccination to prevent infection, as Derek was alluding to, but early intervention with passive immune sera, meaning antibodies from people that have had COVID before, that's very effective. Early intervention with um, Regeneron really works. Remdesivir works to some extent uh, in, um, you know, established and more severe infection, as does uh, steroid dosing and potentially, as I alluded to, uh, JAK2 inhibition, partly because the virus seems to bind to the ACE2 receptor, as Derek was mentioning, but then go in, uncoat, and um, be activated to replicate in part through JAK2 STAT3 signaling. So there, there are different ways to block viral replication. That's the next step. So you remember with the flu, we had the flu vaccine, nowhere near as, uh, as effective as this uh, Moderna or Pfizer mRNA vaccine strategy or other vaccine strategies, but nonetheless, we had the vaccine. And then what took a little bit longer is to make the targeted agents that prevented flu virus from replicating, and uh, that was Tamiflu, and that is really effective. So, you know, really talk to your doctor, find out what your risk is. Um, we have have National Conference of Cancer Centers in the U.S. In California, we have eight NCI-designated Conference of Cancer Centers, and we all have very specific strategies for prevention of COVID and early detection and intervention when people have the COVID-19 infection. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. And I, I have some uh, mRNA questions that I'd like to uh, direct to Dr. Rossi, um, I, which I think it's terrific that the level of questions that we've gotten, and, and one of them has to do with um, how many cells in the body are, are these mRNA therapeutics likely to enter? Does it enter every cell in the body? And what is the likelihood of interaction of these mRNA vaccines and therapeutics with um, other medications that blood cancer patients might be taking. <laughs> and I, well, okay. So um, I'm, I'm going to step back a little bit 
uh, I'll answer it. I may ask you to remind me. But um, Katrina sort of told us a little bit about what mRNA is. Um, and you used an analogy that I've never used before, but I liked it, the, you know, the architect and the builder. I mean, I, so I'll, do, I'll give you my version of that uh, because I, I think it's important that people know what mRNA is because the, the question was about that. And if people understand what mRNA is, they, they start to get a little bit more comfortable with what it is. So Kat Katrina was right to start with DNA. Uh, you know, I, I think everybody knows what, everybody on earth has heard of what, the word DNA and everybody gets that it, it has something to do with heredity. But what people don't actually realize that DNA is actually a rather passive molecule. It doesn't actually do the busy work of the cell. It, it, it encodes the book. The instructions are all there, but the, but the busy work is actually done by effector molecules called proteins. And those are really the worker bees of the hive. They do all the work. But in order for DNA to encode proteins, to, to have that actually made, there's a sort of a neglected uh, middle child, uh, which is mRNA. And it's a necessary intermediate. Uh, the gene, which is encoded on the DNA, is basically, uh, mRNA is synthesized. It's basically a, a faithful replication of the code it carries the code out of a cellular compartment called the nucleus to the cytoplasm, takes that code to the site of, you know, protein synthesis factory called the ribosome. It's read by the ribosome and a protein is made, a specific protein is made. So every one of our cells has hundreds of millions of copies of mRNA in it. So it is not an alien molecule. It's in all cells of our body, and it's it's one of the fundamental molecules of life. You know, I call it the trifecta of life. DNA makes mRNA, makes protein, makes life. That's the first thing that everybody sh should realize. The question is a good one, though. When you're getting the mRNA vaccine, where is it going? How uh, you know how many cells in the body? Well, turns out it's an, as many of us know with that sore upper arm. Uh, it's an intramuscular injection. Uh, and it's actually a pretty localized delivery. The, the cells are in, in proximity to the needle track, see mRNA, uh, and some um, uh, professional antigen, again, another type of immune cells see it. But it's a very, very localized infection, uh, not infection, uh, delivery of the, of the, uh, of the, the, the cargo. The other important thing in which people ask about is, well, do you just get the mRNA or like, what, I've heard about these lipid nanoparticles. What are those exactly? So that's actually, you know, sort of a delivery vehicle, if you will. It's a little fat droplet. If, if anything, it's a little fatty droplet and the mRNA is put inside of this. The, the reason for that is twofold, actually. mRNA is actually a very um, unstable molecule and it's readily degraded by enzymes, proteins in our body called RNases. So by putting it in this fatty capsule, you, when you deliver that into the, uh, to the person, you protect the RNA from being um, eaten and degraded by these RNases. The other thing the lipid nanoparticle does, this is my daughter here, uh, the other thing the lipid nanoparticle does is it facilitates um, uptake into cells, localized cells. And you need uptake of the RNA. You, it has to get into the cell in order for it to be effective because it, it must, that mRNA must go to this protein factory called the ribosome. Its code must be read to express the spike protein to initiate this immune response. But really it is, it's a super localized environment. So if you're getting injected in your left arm and you'll note, You'll note from those that get a sore arm, particularly after the second dose, it's pretty localized to your your the spot of injection. That's because all the immune action is happening there. It's actually a good sign that your arm hurts. <laughs> Whenever you know my friends or family tell me, "Oh, I got my vaccine. It really hurt my arm." I'm like, "Good, your immune system's working. Uh, that's a good thing." It's very localized, so it's not systemic at all, and it's picked up by muscle cells dendritic cells, uh, macrophages, other cells in the localized environment. So that's the, the first issue. Now, are, 
could we envision a time that there's delivery vehicles? And to be honest, for mRNA therapeutics, you, you might want them in, in more cells of the body or other cells of the body. You might use a deliver, different delivery strategy at that point. But right now, the delivery strategy is a localized strategy because that's all you need to, to initiate a localized, uh, which then becomes a systemic immune response. So that's, I think, answer to the first part of the question. And the second part was, oh, uh, about interacting interact with, with drugs. any drugs. Yeah. Um, there's no reason a priority a priori to believe that that would be uh, occurring, although I don't believe it's been studied. Uh, but but there's really no reason to think that that should interfere with, with any enzymes in your body. As I said, its job and what mRNA does is it goes into the ribosome. It's relatively inert until it does that. It's basically a code carrier. It goes into your ribosome. Its code is read. The, MR, or the protein is made, uh, and that's what elicits the immune response. And, and although never say never with biology, and I always say that, never say never with biology, and we don't understand all the, all the machinations of everything, but at, at, I'll remind everybody, I told you at the beginning, each and every one of the cells in your body has hundreds of millions of copies of mRNA in it right now. I think that was a great explanation. Uh, Dr. Jameson, uh, I, have a, I have a question for you uh, that has, it, it's a compilation of a bunch of questions. People are wondering, are there blood cancer patients who should not get vaccinated? And people are asking about particular uh, therapies, uh, bone marrow transplant, CAR T therapy, uh, rituxan or BTK inhibitors. Are there any... Um, caveats. Uh, obviously, everyone's case is individual and they should speak with their own health care provider. I don't want to make Dr. Jameson everybody's doctor, but uh, uh, I think if you can give us some general ideas about this, it will answer a lot of the questions that we received. Yeah, I think the main point is that vaccines are life-saving. Regardless of the type of blood cancer you have, they're life-saving. They have been an absolute game changer. I think initially we had trepidation thinking, oh, maybe they'll have a lot of side effects uh, that will make it difficult to treat people with blood cancers at any stage. And what we're finding is quite the opposite, that by having people not have to deal with COVID-19 infections, because as Derek pointed out, 94% effectiveness is amazing. I mean, we don't have to deal with the sequelae, the uh, short and long-term sequelae of getting COVID-19. Um, so we haven't restricted access to the vaccination. We do want people to be able to mount a proper immune response. And essentially what it takes, you have your first vaccination, um, whether we're talking about Pfizer or Moderna, and then you need a couple of weeks to be able to get your B cells to realize, hey, I have to do something. I have to make an antibody. And then you get the second vaccination, and then that reminds them, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to make what are called antibodies that are able to neutralize or turn off the virus, prevent it from getting into cells and replicating if you actually see real COVID-19 infection. I think the big question comes up when people are on um, therapies that suppress B cells like rituximab uh, or uh, BTK inhibitors like abrutinib. Um, they're, you know, they still have a T cell response. So even though they don't have as good a B cell response, their T cell response is still there and can come to the rescue. The other thing is we have other cells in our system called natural killer cells. And as I mentioned, other cells that form part of what's called the myeloid compartment that can also come to the rescue. And our stem cells, as I was alluding to, are somewhat protected because they have their own internal antiviral strategies. These antiviral enzymes called APOBEC and the other enzyme is called ADAR. So they may provide some protection to our stem cells as well. So there are certain um, types of blood cancers where components of the immune system don't work as well as in B cell malignancies. But the data so far suggests that having vaccination is more protective than not having it. And you know, if we have to time the dosing of our therapies to try and ensure that people have an appropriate immune immune response where we can, we'll do that. Um, but ultimately, preventing COVID is the most important charge that we have as physicians right now. Primum non noceri. Above all, do no harm. So make sure people get the vaccine. 
Thank you, and uh, couldn't agree more. Uh, I am actually going to take the next question area because there were a huge number of questions related to both the safety of the vaccine for blood cancer patients and efficacy uh, in the case where patients know or they're concerned that they may not be making the antibody that is now in some cases being measured after vaccination to see the effectiveness of antibody production. And uh, right now, there are only reports of some patients with blood cancer not making adequate antibody. But as Dr. Jameson has said, that's not the full um, immune response. And so just because you don't have a, a evident antibody in your system, we still don't know that that doesn't mean you're protected. And in fact, there are patients who have no detectable antibody and still seem to be able to fight off COVID. So we have a lot left to learn. I want to have a little time to pitch what LLS is doing, because we realized early on that Physicians and patients needed this information that there may not be an adequate antibody response for blood cancer patients uh, under certain conditions. So how do we learn about this as quickly as possible? Well, we are supporting a lot of scientists who are looking at this in the research setting, but we also have the LLS Michael Garrell Patient Registry. And this is a registry where you as patients can be citizen scientists. You agree to take surveys and provide de-identified medical information that we can compile and work with researchers to answer questions. And this way we crowd, basically crowdsource some of the answers that it takes a long time to test in a, a very rigorous scientific fashion, but we can get some ideas from real world data. And I have to tell you that while we don't have all the answers, we're going to be able to publish some of this data um, that will help understand how people do with making antibody and whether their T cells can compensate. And the thing that I can tell you right now is that in since the end of February, when we started um, asking questions and having patients sign consent for COVID specific questions. We have 3,200 blood cancer patients who have answered this survey and have been fully vaccinated um, with either Moderna, Pfizer, or uh, J&J vaccine. And I can tell you that the safety profile in this group of patients is not different than that that Dr. Rossi showed you in the thousands of healthy volunteers that participated in the trial. And so uh, I can echo what Dr. Jameson says, talk to your doctor. If there is not a medical reason why you shouldn't get the vaccine, you and everyone around you should be vaccinated. Uh, and, and please, Go to LLS.org backslash registry if you're interested in joining us and in answering these questions as a citizen scientist. So now I want to go to um, a couple of questions uh, that, that I think you, you began, both of you answered. There are a lot of questions about the variants the need for booster vaccines against the variants, and how long, if you get vaccinated now, is it likely to last? So I'll leave this uh, because I think both of you can <laughs> can speak about these questions. Well, I'll, I'll just start, and uh, Katrina, you can jump in. So for for how long, you know, the, um, uh, Dr. St. Jameson showed a study that's been published recently that at least six months post, and this is true of both Moderna and Pfizer, uh, antibody levels uh, are very high in patients. So, but the answer is we don't know how long because we, we just, you know, it's it's time dependent and, and uh, we just don't know yet. So it could be that, you know, after 
a year or year and a half, that that immune response starts to wane. Well, guess what? That will definitely be studied. This is one of the most studied uh, 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 populations on the planet right now, as you can well imagine. So we'll see that. That'll be well well reported. In which case. Uh, if the virus has become endemic, and this is something we haven't talked about, uh, which I think is worth talking about, is is this virus going to be around forever? Are we going to be able to eradicate this? Or when I say become endemic, um, you know, the flu flu virus is endemic. It comes it comes every year. Yeah, it comes every year, and we uh, and and it comes in variants every year. By the way. Uh, so we continually have to get our, our, our flu vaccine every year to try to try to mitigate uh, uh, symptoms of, of flu infection. Um, so that's an endemic virus, and it's it's possible. And I would say, based on what I was sort of alluding to earlier about the massive opportunity for this virus to, you know, for mutants, uh, variant strange strains to emerge, the massive opportunity given the tens of millions of people, hundreds of millions of people infected on, on the planet, I think there's there's likely to be um, uh, uh, variants that, that emerge and persist. And by the way, this has to do with vaccine hesitancy. And if there's not a, you know, if there's a certain amount of vaccine hesitancy on the planet and, and most people don't, or a certain percentage of people, you know, maybe approximating her, herd immunity gets vaccinated, but the others don't, well, then we're more likely to see endemic virus uh, emerge. So, um, though, and again, I talked about it. Might we get, uh, you know, variant-specific boosters, if you will? I think that's likely. They're already in clinical testing right now, so I think that's likely. So it may be that the booster you get in a year's time, if you know your immunity wanes or a, a, a variant emerges that is more effective at, at still infecting you despite the fact that you've been vaccinated uh, i think uh, likely you'll see a, a variant specific booster strategy being uh, applied by the uh, by the companies and indeed that's already in testing right now i.e it's foreseeable yeah, my take on it is, um, you know, the follow on to that is if we have a healthier community, if we have a healthier country, so we have fewer people who have viral persistence, or in other words, become human reservoirs for the virus, they just can't get rid of it very quickly. So the virus is more likely to mutate in that person or a person can get reinfected with these different strains and then the virus mutates then we'll all be better off. So in, I'm doing a big plug for blood cancer research because of the increased rates of infection in people with blood cancers, both pre-blood cancers and full-blown blood cancers. So I think the more effectively we eradicate blood cancers and we get back to normal functioning immune systems, the better off we'll be. The other thing is if we vaccinate and we learn what Leukemia Lymphoma Society is putting into place in terms of how well do people mount an antibody response and how well do they mount a T cell response, we'll be better able to gauge how um, frequently we should be applying a booster strategy. The other thing is how random is it that people get these strains, these mutated strains, is this something that our own bodies are doing? And I alluded to these two antiviral enzymes that can actually mutate different viruses. We learned in the case of HIV that our bodies can actually prevent HIV propagation if we get the immune system working properly. Um, but if we stress out the immune system too much, it can hypermutate HIV in part because of our antiviral enzymes just going awry and not getting turned off. So there's a lot we've learned from previous infectious scourges in this country and in the world. And we've learned a lot about how the immune system works. Because of COVID being a pandemic, we're going to learn more than ever about immune responses and how we get them to be healthy again. And the key is what Derek mentioned, is getting back to a greater proportion of patients who are people in the country and in the world who have not only had the vaccine, Vaccine, but shown that they have an effective response to the vaccine. And ultimately, we want anti-replicative strategies, strategies that prevent the virus from propagating itself. 
When I was in medical school and, um, you know, doing my PhD in microbiology and immunology, we were very concerned about HIV, thinking we'll never get rid of it. It's the worst possible diagnosis in the world. It's worse than cancer. Um, well, look at HIV now. We have multi agent therapy. Uh, it, you know, we don't eradicate it, but people live long, normal lives um, with HIV. So, I, you know, I agree with you, Derek, that we're going to be seeing, we're likely to see this virus in different forms, but we'll have many strategies to prevent people from getting it, just like we do with HIV. There's actually a PrEP program, which is preemptive treatment to prevent people from HIV. Um, but we may have something similar for COVID. I think that silly, simple things like a mask, I'm not advertising for Lacoste here, but <laughs> 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 and then there's a little crocodile there to fight the virus. Um, it, these things work. It worked in 1920, in 1918 and 1920. It still works. It still it, works. Things, washing your hands. This is my PhD in microbiology. I can't help it. It was beaten into my head. Uh, it really works. It works I think in the that, kind of that, that brings up maybe a final uh, a final uh, question for us to 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 end with, and that has to do with how, you know, all of us have COVID fatigue uh, and many of the people um, that put in questions have been vaccinated and they want to know, can blood cancer patients start returning to normal life? Can they go back to uh, an open workplace? Can they go to restaurants? Can they travel to see their family on an airplane? Um, can you give us some advice uh, for for those types of questions. Um, I will also put in another pitch that we have lots of information about that on the LLS website specifically for blood cancer patients. Um, so it's a good source of reputable information because it comes from experts like Dr. Jameson and Dr. Rossi and many of the other researchers that work uh, so tirelessly for our patients. But I'd like to hear your thoughts uh, about what blood cancer patients ought to do uh, in terms of going back to normal life if they've been vaccinated. Well, I'll say something and then I'll pass it over to Derek to have the last word um, because he invented this technology that I'm benefiting from and so many of our friends and family members and the whole country is benefiting from. But um, basically what I would say is still take precaution. No vaccine is 100% effective. This is 94% effective in people that have a healthy functioning immune system. Really, we don't know how effective or how durable the responses will be to the vaccine in people that have different types of blood cancers. It's great that the LLS is doing that. We can do that in our own institutions as well um, by looking at antibody immunoglobulin responses as well as um, T cell responses. But I don't think we quite know yet how safe it is to travel. I would still take precautions. Wear a mask when you're in public spaces. Um, now restaurants are at uh, 50 percent occupancy here. You can uh, go out, wash your hands a lot. Just be careful. If you're going to go on a plane, um, just be really, really careful. Um, I would still think that's fairly high risk. And it depends on the type of blood cancer, the type of treatment you're getting. But, you know, take all the precautions as if you hadn't been vaccinated, essentially, because it may be that it's not 100% effective in you and you could still be at risk for getting the um, infection. So the most important thing with COVID is prevent it. Don't get it. Um, we still need to take precautions. We're not out of the woods yet, but it's looking so much better. Until a larger proportion of the population is negative, it just won't be that safe. So now I think we're at 25% of the population in the U.S. being vaccinated. Um, you know, we still have quite a way to go. We think we need to be at at least 70 or 75% to make it safer for everyone. Um, so just please take precautions, protect yourself, protect others, um, get vaccinated as soon as you can. And, um, you know, we're hoping for a better fall and uh, better holidays this year than last. Um, well said, and I echo all that. Uh, I'll just say one other thing, and I would have liked to have pulled up the daily reported infection rate today. But so we, we've vaccination are providing the light at the end of the tunnel. There's no question about that. 
Uh, but we're still at a daily infection rate in the U.S. of in the many tens of thousands. And that's reportable and that's reported and all of us can see it every single day on a, on a day by day basis. So I would actually say that keep monitoring that. And if everybody, A, continue, or as many people continue to get vac vaccinated, those numbers, those daily infection rates will go down, they will. And though, if everybody continues to practice good, you know, hygiene and uh, responsible social distancing and mask wearing. So I would say that when you see those numbers really hitting the floor, by the way, it'll be big news. So you won't even have to look for it because it'll be, it'll be all over your, 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 but, but then of course you realize that, okay, the, the, you know, the, the virus is not infecting five people on my street right now. You know, there might be five people in my state today that have been reported to be infected or or uh, five people in the northeast when you start to see really low numbers like that then you can start to feel confident about going out and, and having a really um you know getting back to like true normalcy but until that point i couldn't agree with uh, dr jameson more uh than you know certain things are risky particularly if you're a, a you know a, a cancer patient uh, you should consider yourself at higher risk for sure and practice good, good, um, you know, all the things that we've been doing uh, for the past year, all of us, hopefully, uh, and uh, to keep yourself safe. Well, I, I thank you both. And uh, I, I will uh, eliminate my final question, which is which vaccine should you get? Because we already know uh, that each of you got a different vaccine. And by the way, Dr. Rossi did not get the Moderna vaccine. He got the Pfizer vaccine. Get whatever vaccine you can get your hands on. Uh, thank you both. Uh, for for giving being so giving of your time and your intelligence uh, to LLS and to our patients, we really thank you. Thanks so much to you and the audience, and thanks, Derek, yet again for your wisdom here and when uh, for guiding the conversation and providing LLS resources for patients. Uh, to uh, thank you to your whole team. Yes, thank you uh, all. I really enjoyed it. It was fun, and and hopefully, uh, you know, it helped answer some of your questions. I noticed I was scrolling through the question, uh, the new question coming in section. There are many, many hundreds of questions that were coming in, uh, so I'm, I guarantee you we didn't uh, get to respond to all of those. But hopefully, you know, what we talked about today gives gives. Uh, provide some light on 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 the subject that that you can feel comfort in and by the way i would say encourage your family members that might not be watching to 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 think about maybe some of the things that were talked about uh, this evening as well wonderful so i'll read Reiterate my gratitude for all of our speakers. Thank you so much. And thank you to each of you for being here with us today and for submitting your question. Uh, as Dr. Rossi, Rossi mentioned, if we were not able to get to your question today, please contact an information specialist at 1-800-955-4572, or you can reach us by email at infocenter at lls.org. Our information specialists are available to answer your questions about COVID-19 and any other blood cancer-related questions you may have. And lastly, participants, please complete the program evaluation, which supports us in developing programs that meet your needs. The link will appear at the conclusion of this presentation. We really appreciate you all taking time out of your evening to participate in this program. And uh, in these unusual times, please rest assured that we're all in this together. Stay well. Thanks very much. Have a good night. Bye. Thanks all. For today's web education program. Thank you for your participation. Please take a moment to complete the evaluation by clicking on the link.